to have a Harvard-educated lawyer. You don't know how hard it is to get into Harvard. Harvard-educated lawyer, my friend Jeffrey. Very impressive. Uh, you were at Harvard as well at a time, you told me, with a guy called Obama. He was there at the same time. He was right after me, yeah. And you played basketball there. Did you play or did he play? Well, I was a ball player. I don't know Aren't you if too he short was a... to play basketball? <laughs> No, actually, I had a pretty good basketball career, Ralph. I, I was 5'8", but I could dunk. Um, and, uh, and so I, I played throughout college and uh, varsity as a, as a, as a freshman. Um, and I also ran track for, for, the, uh, for the varsity as a freshman. So um, I, was, I was an athlete. Um, I played football through grade 9 until I never got that growth spurt that my parents promised me. Um, I'm still waiting, by, as a matter of fact. My, my mother, who was, she was 90 at the time, uh, a couple years ago, and I asked her, you know, Mom, what, whatever happened? She said, you know, son, you've never been patient enough. Just wait, it's coming. <laughs> anyway. I think just generally speaking, some people ask me, well, what's the role of a commissioner, uh, and particularly at the CFL? And I will say that I think it's evolved over time. I'd say you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, the role of a commissioner at any major sports league, but particularly the CFL, was to just make sure the game was played and to preserve the integrity of the game. So, and that was kind of it, you know? I think um, nowadays we live in a much more litigious society, so there are all kinds of legal issues that constantly arise. So legal background is, I think, very important, and it can be invaluable at times. Just understanding um, the, the state of play and some of the nuances based on whatever um, possible conflicts arise or, or dispute res resolution that, that needs to take place. I think from a marketing standpoint, we're always um, in, a, in an effort to uh, get the most reach and, and be the most relevant uh, sports property imaginable. You have to have a mar marketing background and a, and a marketing affinity. Um, licensing also comes into play as well. Uh, intellectual property and understanding of intellectual property. Uh, contract negotiations, uh, player relationships. We deal with a very strong union with the CFLPA. Um, so all of that background, I think, comes into place. And, and that's why I'm really fortunate to be in the position that I'm in, that I'm able to, uh, to capitalize on and, and utilize all those skill sets that I acquired, not only through law school in terms of you know, analytical thinking and problem solving, but real life experience in putting deals together, um, marketing, uh, promoting, licensing, building brands, building businesses, um, and working with professional athletes. So it all came together for me uh, in this job at the CFL that I've had for a little less than two years now. What are your opinions on these illegal streaming sites, and do you believe online broadcasting laws should be implemented? If so, what kind of new laws or policies should be implemented? Well, first of all, I'm a lawyer, so anything that is illegal, um, I, I, I certainly wouldn't condone. I think one of the, the, the challenges that, that we all have, especially nowadays with the advent of technology, is continuing to try to monetize whatever our product or property is. And that's really important because it takes a significant amount of investment to, to create the product. You know, whether it's, whether it's a sports property, um, you've got to pay players, you've got to, uh, to, to uh, launch the, the, the production of it, you've got to do promotion and marketing of it. So all those are costs, and you've got to be able to have a business model that will be able to recoup those costs and ideally um, provide you a profit margin. And I think with uh, illegal streaming where uh, you're not able to, to monetize that or not able to capture revenue from that, it, it's, it's just not good, for, it's not good for business, it's not good for the product, um, and I think it's just unfair. And that's why I think there are laws to prevent illegal streaming. Um, in terms of what else we can do about that, I think once again, you know, people oftentimes, uh, in addition to, to the law, they have to follow their conscience and what they think is fair and right. And there's a reason why we have prohibition against illegal capturing of content. Currently, your role within the CFL as commissioner has led to successes such as the sale of the Toronto Argonauts to Bell Canada, one of the biggest sponsorship deals in league history. 
With your level-headed views of sports and business and your successes as being a leader within the industry, what is your take on female opportunity in sport? Does it bother you that females are object objected, object objectified as merely fashion icons when interviewed pre or post game? Where do you stand on wage discrimination towards professional female athletes? Wow, really good question. So anytime uh, there's a question on, on gender or visible minorities, I, uh, I, it's certainly uh, a topic that's, that's very close to home for me. Uh, the being gen part, the gender side, yeah, the gender side. <laughs> being being part of a of a of a marginalized, uh, historically marginalized and disenfranchised group myself, um, I am particularly sensitive to the barriers that are created and, and some of the hurdles that uh, that we have to try to overcome based on institutionalization of those barriers and hurdles and the and the detours. Um, and the ceilings, and people commonly refer to it as glass ceilings, although sometimes that, that glass is uh, not as transparent um, as glass would seem to indicate. Um, I think the CFL, I'm very proud to be part of the CFL, particularly because we were the first professional sports league to have, uh, have a black starting quarterback way back in 1951, Bernie Custis, who just unfortunately passed away at the age of 88 uh, last week. But, uh, but we started there. We had the first uh, female general manager, I believe, in all of sport, um, in Joanne Pollock, in 1989 uh, in Ottawa. We have now an assistant general manager, Catherine Wright, uh, with the CFL. So I think the CFL has been pro particularly progressive. My senior vice president of content marketing um, is female, um, so Christina Litz. So I think, you know, organizationally, we have been kind of on the edge or at least um, been relatively progressive in terms of our position uh, for opportunities, offering opportunities for uh, marginalized groups, both gender-wise and, and uh, and, and visible minorities. Um, I think any equality is, uh, is a bad thing. I think that sport in general needs to do as much as it can um, to lower those barriers, to make uh, opportunities more available, uh, particularly in executive positions, particularly in decision-making capacities. Uh, it's well known that people tend to hire the people that they are most comfortable with. And I think if you have more women in hiring positions, in those decision-making positions, and, and have that capacity, that more women will actually be involved. Um, certainly, discrimination of any kind is, is, is aberrant to me. Um, and I think we will need to continue to do more uh, to, to make a level playing field, which is what sports should be. My question is with regards to Canadian university sports. Canadian schools often compete against NCAA schools during the year and often beat these NCAA schools. And in the case of Simon Fraser and UBC, those schools only compete in the NCAA, yet their games and teams go unheard of. In your professional opinion, what needs to be done so that Canadian university sport championships reach audience levels similar to American NCAA championships? You know, one, one, of the, uh, one of the challenges that, that Canada has, and I don't see it changing anytime soon, is it is one-tenth the population of the U.S. And so where there are 340 million or 350 million uh, Americans, there are only 34 million Canadians. The, um, the rise of uh, high school and college sports in the U.S., the funding that, that it, it garners, the resources that are applied to it, I think are unprecedented around the world. Um, and there are all kinds of business economics around that as well that serves the US population in the way that, uh, that media and multimedia is structured in the US. It, uh, it, it, it allows for that. You, know, you have the rise of regional sports networks. You have um, multimedia platforms which generate an incredible amount of revenue that the university system is able to, to be the beneficiary of, and so they can reinvest in their programs and, and expand their programs. So I think because of the, the, the economics of it, because of the structure of it, um, I think that the US is probably unique 
in terms of college sports and the ability to support college sports. And quite frankly, you know, the same paradigm does, does, and the same parameters just don't exist in Canada. So we're Canadians, Canadian teams are definitely competitive uh, when it comes to uh, the playing field. I don't think that we could ever really rival the amount of um, exposure and, uh, and, and resources that, that the U.S. has. Roger, Roger's acquisition of broadcast rights to NHL games was subject to much scrutiny from the media. At the time, you were executive director at CBC Sports, and you were at the head of negotiations with the NHL. I was wondering if you could offer us some insight into what actually transpired during this negotiation process. You know, people often ask me, um, they hold me responsible for losing the, the rights to Hockey Night in Canada. We actually, the, the CBC owns the, the brand Hockey Night in Canada. Um, that's good. What we did was we, um, we lost the right to broadcast live NHL games, which the NHL always had the rights to. We were basically leasing those rights for, for a fee. Uh, and when people ask me, you know, give me one good reason why, 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 you, couldn't, why you couldn't compete. I said, I can give you 5.2 billion reasons why CBC couldn't compete. Rogers paid $5.2 billion for the rights, uh, for the NFL, NHL rights. Uh, that's about $455 million a year, which is probably, it has been reported to be uh, almost triple what the rights had been uh, between both CBC and TSN uh, in that last NHL deal. And in comparison, the U.S. is uh, 10 times larger than Canada in terms of the footprint. NBC pays $200 million. Rogers pays $455 million. So um, you guys do the math. The interesting thing is that the NHL decided to go to a single gatekeeper model. So instead of bifurcating those rights and stratifying them, where you had CBC as the free-to-air rights holder and you had TSN as the, the cable distribution platform and, and then possibly there was a mix and, and a non-exclusive that they would have on digital broadcast, um, the NHL decided that they would best be served by going to one distributor who was vertically integrated, who had all those different access points and just distribution channels. As the 13th commissioner of the Canadian Football League, you have improved the sport and industry in various ways during your term. One of your accomplishments is implementing an enhanced, extensive, and transparent drug testing policy for the CFL players in 2016. Um, the policy covers banned substances that are deemed to be performance enhancing drugs um, and notably excludes recreational drugs such as marijuana. In contrast, marijuana is still a banned substance in the NFL and um, players are subjected to fines and suspensions based on that policy. Uh, even the World Anti-Doping Agency establishes marijuana and cannabinoids as um, substances that are prohibited in competition. So with um, Winnipeg Free Press exposing the league's long history of pot use, uh, do you believe that the current policy protects the integrity of the game even when it doesn't prevent or combat the use of potential performance enhancing drugs such as marijuana? Okay, so, so the first thing is that, that I need to comment on is I'm not sure, I'm not familiar with the Winnipeg Free Press's article or, or investigative journalism on what you have described as a long-standing history of pot use you deal in with the Harvard CFL. Lawyer. He's going to parse every. No, 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 no. I just no. I, I just want to make sure that 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 there isn't misinformation that that continues to be promulgated. So I, I can't speak to that, and I don't know about what what they've done and in, and in, in what what investigation and and the levels of journalism. But I would like to dispel the the insinuation that it is a problem among the CFL. I can't comment on other leagues, I, I don't know, but uh, I've never, I've been with the league a couple years now. Um, that has not surfaced as a problem for us. What had been a problem for us is the fact that the CCES, the Canadian Center on Ethics and Sport, and the WADA accredited laboratory out of Montreal 
who services our drug testing program didn't feel that our program was robust enough. They didn't feel that the sanctions were significant enough to deter, um, to deter performance enhancing drug use. So I came on board in 2015 and the third week I was in my chair, um, the uh, lab decided that they were no longer going to test uh, CFL athletes and they were no longer going to administer our program unless things changed. Fast forward, uh, long story short, um, I had to work with the players union uh, to come to an agreement with them on how we would go forward. And the issue was not, it was not a, an issue between uh, a confrontation between the Players Association and, and the league. It was how can we institute a, a, a drug testing program which was important and significant. The bottom line is we worked with the lab, the Montreal-based lab, which is WADA accredited. We worked with CCES and we worked with the Players uh, Association to make sure we came up with a policy that was educational, that continued to raise awareness of the, the, the detrimental effects of performance enhancing drugs, and also <clears throat> institute significant enough sanctions as to deter the potential use of performance enhancing drugs in our league. For me, what was most important probably was not only preserving the integrity of the game and making sure it was a level playing field, but also the message that it sent. It sent the message to young people that there are no shortcuts, that, that there are no, no ways to, to, to circumvent the system. You have to work hard, you have to sacrifice, you have to be in the best physical and mental condition you can possibly be to, to make this league. And just like there are no shortcuts in, in life, there are no shortcuts getting to the CFL. So that's really important because PEDs are so damaging to people's health um, and especially young kids. So, so that was important. Um, we continue to work with CCES and the lab to make sure that we have the right standards and, and the right sanctions to not only deter, but to assist and support. So for example, uh, in the previous drug testing policy before I came on board, the first infraction was a warning. Now we've changed that to, it's an automatic two game suspension. The second violation is a nine game suspension. And the third violation is you are suspended for a calendar year. If you get busted for a fourth time, you're out of the league. So by, by creating that kind of, um, those kinds of penalties that hopefully deters the, the use of, uh, of PEDs. How we decide on that list of PEDs, we work in concert with the water accredited lab um, and CCS. So uh, recreational, a recreational drug like marijuana is not part of the performance enhancing drug categories that, that, that uh, the C CFL follows. Through your experience with revising the CFL's drug policy while working with the CFLPA and the only lab in Canada authorized by the World Anti-Doping Agency, what barriers exist and what anti-doping efforts may be taken to prevent increased doping among athletes and institutional manipulation of the drug testing process in the Olympics? Wow, that's a, that's a really weighty question. I think some of the things that, that, that we're doing, obviously, um, as you pointed out, we've increased the frequency of drug testing. So we test the equivalent of every player. Um, if you are uh, found to have been in violation, in addition to the two game suspension, there's mandatory testing for two years. Um, so that's also in, you know, ideally serves as a chilling effect or an inhibitor or certainly a deterrent. For, for continued use. Um, I think we continue to work with, with the labs, uh, particularly you know, the WADA accredited lab, and, um, and follow their lead in terms of their latest testing, the technology and testing, to, uh, to try to make sure that um, it is as robust and as stringent as possible. And we're not responsible for the detection methods, but you know, just like um, 
elusive measures are becoming much more sophisticated, testing measures are too. So I think you know, we'll continue to, to, to promote the fact that there are penalties now if you break the rules. And there are significant penalties. And if you think about it, if you're a professional athlete and, uh, and your livelihood is dependent on playing, because if you don't play in the CFL, you don't get paid. Um, and if you're suspended for half of the season or a year, that could be your career because there's somebody else who's stepping up to take your spot, right? So I think those kinds of deterrents are, are the, the, the rules that are in place um, and the penalties that are involved certainly serve to, to narrow that gap between um, people who are even considering cheating the system and those who actually do it. Looking at other sports and the minimal Canadian teams that appear in national leagues, how do you think the CFL, as well as other Canadian leagues and teams, can grow and improve in popularity so that our citizens may have more pride in their country's athletics? Do you think an appearance of video games, as said in the Toronto Star article, may bring more attention to younger audiences? So under my watch, there are three things that I'm focused on. Reach, relevance, and relationships, right? So we have to broaden our reach that I spoke about before. We've got to um, be more relevant, um, which I'm going to get to in a second, and we need to deepen our relationships. And it's deepening our relationships, not just with our avid fans, but that next generation of fans. We've made a concerted effort to go after that next generation of fans, which I'm talking about you guys. So here's what we did. We have a deal with DraftKings, which is uh, a daily fantasy gaming uh, product that originated in the States, and they're, they're the leader in this space. And that will give us not only greater exposure here in Canada, but also help penetrate the US market. Because you can actually go on and play daily fantasy. We also have a pick 'em game, which is a lot simpler, where you can just you know, choose whichever team you think is going to win um, at, at the end of the week. So, um, so we're, we're into fantasy gaming. Um, Last year, actually last October, we just partnered with EA. So anybody play the Madden game, Madden football game? So there are like, I don't know, tens of millions of people who play that. So the CFL now is now embedded in the Madden game where if you get a certain number of points, you will get five, you will have access to five CFL legends. People like Warren Moon and Doug Flutie and, and Joe Theismann. So the CFL now has a presence in a, in a Madden game, so which is the biggest video game out there. We're doing much more on social media. Um, we're creating our own content. Uh, we have our own podcast now called The Waggle. Um, we've got a, 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 a show with uh, Max and Brody, which is kind of a lifestyle show um, focused on, on, on the CFL um, and social media, right? So we're, we're focused on shareable content. So we're doing video games. We're doing fantasy. Um, we're utilizing the digital platform. Um, our social media, we've gone up 120% social media, 100% in, in our mobile app. Uh, app. Um, we've gone up 100 plus percent in uh, traffic on our website, all this in the last year. Instagram is up uh, 284%. Um, Snapchat is up 87%. Facebook is up 34%. So all those platforms, Twitter. where Twitter, right, Twitter. It's the only one I can do. They were telling me, right. what were you telling me I had to do last week? Was it Snapchat or something that I right. have to do? That's I, right. I'll never run that. So anyway, to, to your point, we are actually um, reaching out and, and promoting our product to that next generation of fans, which had been, um, frankly, underserved up until now. But you think about all those platforms and everything we're doing on social media, fantasy, gaming, um, you know, shareable content, creating our own content. That's where the future is. That's what I recognize, and that's, that's what we're doing. And we're having really good success so far. Our penetration of our female demographic is up 7 or 8% in the last year. Um, the 18 of, to 34-year-old, that demo is up like 12%. Um, we've made really good strides in a year. So, um, so I'm excited. I'm really excited about the future. My question is, given your legal education and experience in the private sector, what kind of effect, if any, has your legal education had on your business career? 
How has your knowledge of the law assisted you in preparing sponsorship deals and contracts between the CFL and North American corporations? Yeah, great question. I, I think my familiarity with contracts, um, having been a, a corporate lawyer, um, has been invaluable because there are nuances that, that you'll be able to discern when, when you look at deals and, and how to put deals together. I think the other aspect is, you know, in law school, it just teaches you a certain way of thinking, a certain, it hones your analytical skills. And I think in any business relationship, you've got you've to analyze not only the content, but you've got to analyze the, uh, the, 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 the risks and the, and the opportunities. So I think that, that better prepares you for that. Um, I think that, uh, you know, there's no substitute for experience also. And the fact that many deals are very similar in terms of format, um, the content may be a little different, but in terms of format and, and key guiding principles. And so you're already prepped for that. So I, I think I've had a leg up on, on, on putting you know, significant deals together based on, on my legal training, um, but also my legal experience, so. Uh, you've seen today the Game Football League is in good hands with my friend Jeffrey. I urge you. After hearing him, to go to a game, buy a ticket. Don't Thanks. don't spend fifteen hundred like I did. But go to a game. Thank you. See you next week.